Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about video games. Today I'm continuing on with my favorite games of all time, this time covering numbers 10 to 6. 10 is part of a series that originally asked me if I want to be a hero. And I did want to be a hero. Quest for Glory Shadows of Darkness was developed by Sierra Online and released for PC in 1993. It's a mix of point-and-click adventure and RPG. After the events of Quest for Glory 3, the hero finds himself unceremoniously transported and starts the game in a mysterious cave in the land of Mordavia. Though over the past three games you've proved yourself a hero to many, no one here knows or trusts you when you arrive. And why would they when you emerge from a place called the Dark One's Cave? Strange and dangerous beings lurk in Mordavia, so you have to prove to people that you aren't a threat by helping them with their many problems. Slavic folklore is the basis for this game, and you run into creatures like the protective Domovoy, temperamental Leshy, and ill-fated Rusalka. Shadows of Darkness does a good job of combining ridiculous side characters and an obscene amount of puns with questlines that can be touching and sincere. The Innkeeper's Missing Daughter is a story that always stood out for me. Each of the four classes you can be all have their own interesting events and abilities. I find the variety of magic spells makes it hard to choose a class other than a magic user, though the Thieves' Guild is always fun and being a paladin lets you do more good for more people. The 94 release of the game is fully voice acted and the characters really come to life. Learning about them and helping them with their troubles is immensely satisfying. The whole game is narrated by John Rhys Davies, and Quest for Glory 4 is also notable for being Jennifer Hale's first voice role in a video game. The next game showed me that the Final Fantasy series wasn't the be-all end-all when it came to JRPGs. Star Ocean Second Story was developed by Triace and released for the PlayStation in 1999. It's a Japanese role-playing game set in a science fantasy world. This game won me over immediately when it let me pick which of two protagonists I wanted to play. There's Claude Kenny, a space cadet from the advanced planet Earth, and Rena Lanford, who lives on a medieval-level planet and has a mysterious healing power. Though the overall plot of the game stays the same, the character you choose will impact the game's introduction, some scenes you see throughout, and even which other characters will be available to join your party. Upon entering a town, you get the option of splitting up with the rest of your group. When you do this, you can go find them, see what activity or location has drawn their attention, and have a private moment to talk and find out more about them. Star Ocean was just so different than any RPG I had played before. Or since, really. It has an expansive crafting system that depends on each character's skills. You can create art, music, do blacksmithing or alchemy. There's even an Iron Chef-inspired cooking competition. This is where the game cemented itself in my list of favorites. Crafting in RPGs is something I usually find to be an annoying extra, but selecting two ingredients and wondering how they'll go together, seeing glimpses of what could be created while a weird bloop bloop noise is made, so satisfying. Aside from the character conversations and the crafting, is some very engaging combat. You get to fight with four characters rather than the usual three, and it's not turn-based. You can move freely around the field, using attacks and spells, and switch between characters to control as you like. These things made Star Ocean's second story unique and memorable, and something I really wish would be re-released for modern systems outside of Japan. An FMV game has made it all the way to number 8 on the list. If you know me, that shouldn't be too surprising. The Pandora Directive was developed by Access Software and released for PC in 1996. It's an FMV adventure game where you play private investigator Tex Murphy. 
What starts as a missing persons case quickly spirals into a hunt for a serial killer and a story about aliens and nefarious government agencies. This released around the same time as season 3 of The X-Files, so the story was totally my jam. Pandora Directive takes everything I loved about its predecessor, Under a Killing Moon, which was number 39 on this list, and does it a little bit better. There are more locations to visit and people to talk to. There are so many more puzzles, which range from fairly simple to deviously challenging. And there's still a great help system if you're stuck on what to do next or want to skip a puzzle. The game is quite humorous and self-aware, though also has a more serious tone. Here we're not only managing Tex's case, but also his personal life, and there are multiple endings based on our decisions. You can play Tex as someone honorable who always tries to take the high road, as selfish and cynical, or as someone who naively tries to have it both ways. The ideal use of full motion video is exemplified here. Whereas many FMV games can feel like you're just watching a subpar movie and occasionally hitting a button prompt, here it is integrated so well. FMV is used for cutscenes and conversations, but otherwise you can roam freely through a 3D rendered environment, looking for clues and solving puzzles. The cast features a number of well-known actors like Tanya Roberts and Kevin McCarthy, and the writing and acting is all very well done. The next game is an iconic and hilarious point-and-click adventure that pushed the genre forward in a number of ways. The Secret of Monkey Island was developed by Lucasfilm Games and first released for PC in 1990. It's a point-and-click adventure game where you play want-to-be pirate Guybrush Threepwood. While undergoing the three trials needed to become a pirate, he falls in love with Governor Elaine Marley, who is kidnapped by the nefarious ghost pirate LeChuck. Guybrush needs to put together a crew to go rescue her. The Secret of Monkey Island was designed to be much more accessible than most adventure games of the time. There are no dead ends, no ways to get yourself in an unwinnable situation, and it's immensely hard to get Guybrush killed. This is the first adventure game where I never got mad at myself for not saving recently enough. In addition to this, the game is consistently funny, and insult sword fighting is one of the most memorable elements in gaming for me. You fight like a dairy farmer, how appropriate you fight like a cow, is one of the best game quotes. Traveling the roads of Melee Island, searching for pirates to match wits with, and learning new insults and comebacks is a real joy. The game subverts expectations at every turn, most obviously when we learn that Guybrush's rescue of Elaine causes more problems than it solves, and this supposed damsel was never really in distress. Monkey Island is not afraid to poke fun of itself, games in general, or the player. The writing and structure of the game is, for me, some of the best. I also have to point out the amazing pixel art when we get a close-up of the characters. So good. Six is my top JRPG, and it combines interesting characters, a story sort of influenced by history, and a great sense of humor. Shadow Hearts Covenant was developed by Nautilus and released for PS2 in 2004. It's a Japanese role-playing game set in the midst of World War I. It follows an unlikely group of heroes across the globe as they try to stop a group of sorcerers intent on world domination. The main protagonist is Yuri, a man who can transform into demons, but we also get to play as other characters as the game progresses and see multiple storylines that all converge in the end. There are two big things that make this game special in my eyes. The first is the humor. Though the tone can be serious, it's filled with ridiculous characters and events. One of your party characters is Joachim, a vampire who can turn into a bat. He's also a wrestler who gets weapon upgrades wherever he can find them. Mailboxes, giant frozen tunas, pillars, as long as it's big and bludgeony, he'll take it. 
To get upgrades for another character, you have to collect stud cards, pictures of scantily clad muscular men, which you can trade to a tailor to make you new gear. There is a lot of sexual innuendo in this game. The second thing I love is the various systems. Combat uses the Judgment Ring, which makes the turn-based combat much more active by adding a timing element to attacks. Each character has their own set of abilities and a unique method of improving them. Karen learns new sword techniques by finding Wagner operas. Blanca the dog learns new abilities by taking part in an international dogfighting ring. Princess Anastasia takes pictures of enemies, which allows her to use their abilities. Shadowheart's Covenant features so much progression for its lovable cast of characters, and it's paced out so well. It makes this one of the few games in the genre that never gets boring. That's it for this episode. The next one is the final one. Can you guess what my favorite games of all time are? If you missed it, check out the last episode in this series, or my full review of The Secret of Monkey Island. I have a Patreon if you're interested in supporting my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.